I'm going to ask Lester some questions about life in Papua New Guinea, how he felt about it. Um, your life up there in Papua New Guinea, was it good or was there some problems or there some things that made life more difficult? So you'd like to talk about that. Overall, no really tough times at all. Uh, there were quite a lot of concerns in later years, but of course, early on when you first got there, uh, it was just, it was wonderful to be working there. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was on top of an idyllic childhood in Finch <laughs> Well, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I suppose when you look back, well, security of, of how we lived, uh, we had uh, you no know, locks on the doors as you, as you come in and out of that the house, first house we lived in, there was insect screens to keep the mosquitoes out, but no louvers or anything, and uh, we, we felt quite safe. And, uh, but in, in our latter years, particularly some years after independence, uh, there started to be quite a bit of so-called rascal activity going on. And uh, uh, by the mid-80s, mid-1980s, all of our houses at Umpo, we had them uh, secured in a very high way in re with strong bars and windows, double deadlocks, and, and uh, we had alarm, household alarms and so on in, on the house. Uh, because of the threat from rascals breaking in, uh, who were... Uh, so you actually did get broken into? We you? got broken, in, broken into twice, once when I had an office downstairs and they were just after, after looking for petty cash and the other time we were happened to be at WOW when we got notice about it. But fortunately, uh, one of the, a national family who lives close to us saw all this happening and they sent out some alarms and chased the rascals yeah. away. In the latter years, the rascals might not have ran away. They'd have been there with their guns and did what they wanted to do. The overseas partners then churches uh, uh, paid for the cost of of us hiring three security guards from professional security companies to sit around up during the day and uh, patrol a part of the night. So but, tell us about your friends, that's a happier topic. Who were your friends in Papua New Guinea? Best, best one of all was Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. And so the two tell boys. Us about Elaine, what she was doing all those years. Yeah, well, uh, she worked helping the Christian Book Centre. Uh, uh, she uh, worked uh, looking after the the cash income from Luther Air, Lutheran Aviation yeah. at Lay. She'd go and pick up the money at the end of the day and count for it and bank it, different things like that. Uh, and then uh, for three or four years, she worked as the treasurer at Bullock Teachers College until they trained a lady to replace her. Uh, soon after that, the overseas partner churches uh, asked her to uh, be in charge of the missionaries vehicle loan scheme, which was a significant yeah. scheme to assist missionaries to buy vehicles and uh, have, the, have their set amount of reimbursements for the work they did. So um, she kept very busy because she also had a family yeah, yeah, two boys, and the two boys. Bruce and Alan, and, uh, and some of the time they were in Australia in school. Yeah, they did the schooling, primary schooling, in the first three years of high school at Lane. Yeah, and then we sent them both down to Emmanuel College at here in Adelaide to do their final two years of high school, and from there then they went out into their careers, both working. And then the Elaine was asked to do a lot more work for the overseas partner churches uh, in regard to records of shopping trips for missionaries and uh, visas and this sort of stuff. And then, uh, and then finally she became the overseas affairs officer in the National Church headquarters, which supervised uh, visas and work permits and this thing for missionaries coming and going. It was quite responsible. We had many fine friends amongst the national people at the, at the head office at Lane. Uh, most of the district presidents were great. I used to catch up to them when they came down for church council meetings and uh, uh, some other special ones. Uh, two of the church secretaries we had, uh, Reuben Curry for a number of years and Fua Singin, they were just top three really wonderful friends, wonderful people. Yeah. Yeah, just, you wouldn't think of them in, in any other way. Um, and you used to take your New Guinean friends out fishing and Many people come here with me, only one or two at a time because they had a small boat. But yeah. <laughs> Did you have a bit of time for a social life too? 
Well, outside of the direct missionary church circle, uh, from 1984, we became members of the Lay Yacht Club because I built a little boat mm -hmm. to be able to operate that. It was under their care. I saw it hanging up in, in the Yacht Club. As, an, as like a memorial to you. <laughs> with fishing uh, a memorial to itself, because it had brought in <laughs> yeah, many, quite a few club records and different things. And uh, what was it called? It was called Salt Shaker. The Salt Shaker. That's 12 feet or 3.6 yeah. metres long. Anyway, yeah, yeah, we, we caught about, caught over 12 tons of fish over the years in that Saturday morning, generally. And that fishing. would not be an exaggeration, because Lester was one to keep very careful records of Fish caught. Anyway, as members of the Yale Yacht Club, and uh, I, I then joined uh, the, game, the Lay Game Fishing Club at the same time. Yeah. And, uh, I, uh, I actually joined it on the, happened to be on the very day that they were having an AGM that night, and uh, finished up walking out as the secretary of the club. I thought I'll do that for a, for a year or two and learn some things and meet a lot of people, and, and that's it. But uh, I did that then for 19 years, and I, I really enjoyed that, and I got to know many people. Uh, so consequently, uh, Elan and I used to go down to the yacht club uh, most Tuesday evenings when they would have a barbecue night on, and we'd socialise with people there. And, and most times there were one or two or three other small families from our boat, national expatriates, and also naturals. You took me out fishing one day, and it happened to be the day when the game fishing people were having that big competition and they all went out in their very expensive boats with sonar and all kind million dollar boats whatever they were and they were like the disciples they caught nothing Imagine, yeah. <laughs> there was a very lean day that they had meanwhile you and I and I think one New Guinean went out in this little boat and we, we caught so many fish that the, the boat was nearly sinking and we were also towing behind us a, a huge shark that we'd caught and we <laughs> pulled up and they had finished their day they were standing on the wall there with a with a glass or a stubby yeah. and then looked down and saw this <laughs> they just <laughs> couldn't believe what they, what they saw <laughs> part of the problem was they're all trolling for game fish and yeah. we caught most of the fish off the bottom you know the headline yeah but i must tell you, you, might, you it would have been exhilarating for you to watch them catching a fish and remember that more than once he's hooked onto a fairly big jewfish or maybe a 16 kilo shark 350 feet down there with a headline he's pulling on it and it took about 15 minutes or whatever to get it up we finally got it up captain the boat and Dean's hands are going like this and I don't know is he worn out or is he excited I think he's <laughs> excited <laughs> both maybe that was a real R&R &R, to get away from the town and yeah. on the water and that's in, so in nature. It's so important, isn't it? Nobody could find you yeah. in those days. Were there some challenges during your time in Papua New Guinea? Probably the main ones that concern me probably related to some understudies I had, the times to train someone to take your place. Uh, while I was managing Umpo Builders, uh, I had about three there after yeah. the three expatriate people. and. Uh, and, and then later when I was ch doing church construction advisor, just drafting and drawings and so on uh, for the congregations, I had a draftsperson with me too. Uh, there were problems there too. Uh, however, my last nine years with property development uh, and project management, uh, my understudy was, was pretty good and that he was doing what he could by the time I had to leave. And, uh, so that was good. But most of the issues, Maybe you shouldn't mention it, but they're related to alcohol problems. Uh, handling cash was another one, and uh, occasionally there was infidelity. The one of them trying to hit up with someone else's wife or the husband was away at work, and these human things, uh, they, were, they were concerned because you were hoping this man was going yeah. to get your job. And all this. Um, so people who know Lester Rorlach know that you have a truly inquisitive mind and a deep appreciation for the wonders of God's amazing creation. So over the years you have developed an extraordinary number of hobbies and interests, including sporting ones. Now we've just talked about fishing, <coughs> which is maybe top of the list, <laughs> yeah. um, but there are, there are so many interests that you 
had. So uh, could you talk about one or two of these? Well, I was still a young fellow before I went to college and then in later years too. Uh, Mum and Dad had been there a long time and very often new missionaries would arrive and, and uh, there'd be guests at our place before they go on to their stations or whatever. And I can remember Mum and Dad often saying to them, it's pretty important that you have an outside interest besides your work too, like a hobby or some special interest, so that you can enjoy. Uh, helps with the balance. And sometimes you might be on an outstation for a long time, and so that's good. Uh, but for me, that was never a problem. I just, I just always wanted to do things, yeah. collecting things. So I collected a wide, wide range of insects that are often was involved with Sunday family picnics. Sunday afternoon we go for a picnic and we did collect blue weevils and catch butterflies and things. And uh, I bred butterflies quite a bit. I did acrylic painting or learnt acrylic painting of insects and fish. I raised a lot of, uh, uh, well, tropical aquarium fish. I raised even scorpions, kept two small, a few small pythons and a, a oh. cuscus or you might say a possum for people who don't know for a while. Uh, did photography, uh, and a regular social competition tennis. A whole family involved with tennis, tennis regularly yeah. on Saturday. Yeah, and played and too, she played a lot, yeah. yeah. And then in teams and, and in social tennis on Saturday afternoons, we had to play table tennis as a family and with guests. I got involved with target archery for 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 several years and uh, progressed there and uh, finished up. Uh, uh, represented PNG in a four-man team in the World Target Archery Championships at Canberra one year. It happened to be a year we were on leave. And in my early years, I spent a lot of quite a lot of time after work before dark collecting shells and sometimes at night with a lamp, especially when we were living at, at Madang, out on the harbour, and uh, had uh, built up a significant national collection there. I can remember how when we ended up fishing, isn't it, it was no, it wasn't just luck that you got so many fish. It's because you knew where the fish were and you knew how to, to um, catch them. Because I remember you lining up the boat, oh, yeah. the markers on the land, you knew exactly where the fish were down and going to be down the bottom. That's because it was luck finding them in the first place. And then you took notes of what, what's yeah, way so, you, so that you could get back to the same likely place. But <laughs> we did most of those hobby things at different times. So for a year or two and I'd drop off and I'd try something try else. Something you know, else. So. Anyway, and that's, so. that's that's the way you were, and I mean you brushed over very quickly, but one of them was photography, and photographs. Probably doing more of that now that we're yeah. on leave here and I've yeah. got a better quality camera and I can't go fishing anymore and <laughs> too old to play tennis. The book yeah. about the first Lutheran missionary in the beginning, Johan Fleel, is called My Life in God's Mission. Do you have the feeling or the conviction your life too has been a life in God's mission. Well, I'd say from the first week in December 1967, I believe so, right through. There weren't any other mission builders on the field from about the late 1970s or so, so uh, except one for a short while, so my input ranged pretty widely then by geography where I went and had to go to and so on, and the scope of services and the building industries and so on. I felt that I was, I was helpful. Uh, I was working for the whole church then, not just in a particular district. Uh, they based at Lane most of the time. Uh, I was quite pleased or tickled one day when uh, one day the chairman of the Board of Overseas Missions and Church Corporation, Dr. Ron Kahadi, came along and he said, uh, after a big church council meetings, he said the Highland several of the Highland uh, district presidents, they demanded that, that the overseas partners get them. They said, we want a Mr. Rollock of the Highlands. <laughs> Can you find one? <laughs> so that's a, very, that's a very fine compliment. You've been honoured in a formal way, haven't you? The 25th anniversary of PNG's independence, which was in 2000, was you know, formally awarded with a silver jubilee medal big piece of bronze or something, yeah. with a ribbon and all that. And people got them for different things. Yeah. And in my case, I can't remember the words of it, it was related to infrastructure services given to many 
communities. So what you related to to, 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 to grassroots yeah. yeah, to the grassroots people. Yeah. So as you look back, what memories in particular do you treasure? If we've been there for a long time, Elaine and I were both blessed, really blessed to support the mission staff and the people. Much yeah. of our work was supporting the missionaries yes. and the people who were serving the people as lay people, also to the lay people for our 36 years there. And, uh, and we did so without really any serious health issues until the last year when Elaine's health became bad. God was especially good to us. He certainly protected us far more than we realised at the yeah. time. You think life's going on, I'm okay, we're okay, you know, but uh, he's looking after us all the time, whether in the workshop or the office or on the roads or at sea or flying. Yeah, quite often I was quite anxious flying around the little systems amongst the mountains and the clouds. Yeah, we've got some interesting stories here I've written about too. Yeah. But I did, did hear, hear of one instance. God was looking after me, I'm sure. Yeah. It was a week after one of our congregational church council meetings uh, at the Resurrection in town there, and our pastor at the time, Reverend Murray Jordan, he told me that uh, uh, he had heard from the congregation's youth group that I'd been a target for the rascals one day, that the previous evening when I was on my way home uh, at about 9.30 at night, I had to cross that little one way bridge across the Bumbu River. And uh, there in PNG, uh, at least in the Lutheran Church, uh, the congregation's youth group had quite a range of youth in there. They'd be anywhere aged from 14 to even up to 35, yeah, right. 40, you know. You'd, Oh, youth. The youth were always so young, <laughs> but they would hang in there. And yeah, they were kind of leaders there. Anyway, I was just about to cross this like, one lane bridge and uh, unaware that there was a bunch of rascals hiding in the grass at the other end, ready to drag a log out to stop me. And they were going to yeah rob me and whatever they're going to do with me. I don't know and take off with a vehicle, probably to do another job or hold up or something. As it turned out, one of the rascals whispered to the rest of them, "Hey, let him go." I know him, he's one of us, was what he said, which meant he's a good one, he's around, let him go, you know, That's he's point. one of the mission folk, I suppose. What Rufus, your uncle, said to us, he said, the best security in Papua New Guinea is the people, we know your the, friends. I was fortunate, uh, this, well, it might have even been a resurrection for my youth, some, some youth were known to transit between a working job and being a rascal at times. For me, the last, those last 19 years, they lay especially close to my heart. Uh, all, all that liaising back and forth with the various congregation leaders and the pastors who were doing all the designing in the churches, talking one-on-one -on -one with people that are, quite a lot of them I'd never known before, the pastors I, I knew. There were just some really strong ones that you can yeah. just have with these people. You know you're helping them. They, they thank you so much. They're just so humble and thank you for and I, they go out the door and I say, well, already, I've just given you some drawings here. Somehow, God's blessing them and you yeah. at the same time. And, yeah. and so my association with ELC PNG's second, third and fourth number one bishops, I have to mention them. Uh, these people, bishop, well, they were called number one bishops. Uh, they were, as people call them now, they were district presidents. So, so Zura where Zura not. So it's the first of them after John Cooter. Uh, the third one was Gataka Gam, and the third and the, f the fourth one was Reverend Wesley Kingersall. With them, I have just the warmest and the most best memories. They were just such gentlemen. Gataka was a bit stubborn in some regards, but he was a really good man. They they were real leaders. Yeah. Yeah, well, in the end, I designed Zoro's retirement home. He said, "Have you got to design a home for me at Saddleburg?" So I did all that, and uh, Gataka Gam well. He fought to keep Ellen and I at work yeah, at ELC PNG at that time and then. with Thorpe Metzner's uh, yeah. ideas there, it worked out. And uh, and then Wesley Kugitzum, he was a student, third year student, when I was building Martin Luther Seminary. We had him in for in, in our place as a, as a guest for one meal together with uh, Patrick Kassel and uh, David Pizzo. I said to Ellen when they left, I reckon these fellas, those three are going to be we were right. And, uh, and, and Wesley, he was, he was just as close a brother as you could yes, be. He was just, just so sad that he 
passed away when you did. So we're about to conclude, and is there anything else you'd like to add before you do that? Uh, no, not really, except after so many years you might think it's pulling out of the air, but I've gone to my records, yeah. I've got a lot of old letters that I used to write home to, to home folk in Australia over the years, I can refer to them there, and uh, since I got my first computer in the, in the 90s at Laywall, there's thousands of letters and things I've still got. On those records. Your presentation, Robert, you were talking with us um, this morning, says a lot about the person you were. You do everything really thoughtfully and carefully and give of yourself unstintingly. So thank you for sharing with us this morning. It's all fine. God, God bless you and um, Elaine too. Thank you. Thanks a lot.